Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, peace be upon you. Welcome to today's episode of Arba'een Reflections. Today's episode is on Shia genocide. This is the label given to the oppression of the Shia, which has historically uh, been issued by the enemies of Ahl al-Bayt upon the Imams and their followers, and continues today unto the lovers of Ali Muhammad in multiple countries. And the term Shia genocide is what is used to describe this transnational suffering and oppression often issued by the state or permitted by state establishments. This topic, whilst being very important in alleviating suffering today, also helps understand Shia identity, who we are, is very closely linked to what we have been through and what we've been through and continue to go through today is suffering. To understand this topic today, we are joined by two uh, very qualified guests. First, we have Said Ali Raza Lizvi, um, who returns after graciously accepting us in the initial series of our shorter reflections and he comes with a, as a, an individual who's lecturing and reciting in multiple countries and is leading the Shia Qawm in multiple capacities including in Pakistan one of the countries where we are seeing extreme Shia genocide and joining him is Sister Medina Talibi. Sister Medina is currently researching the topic of Shia genocide and anti-Shia violence and is preparing an article in which she discusses um, the theme of Shia genocide and different ways in which the individual and the collective can phrase this phenomenon in a way which can help practically helping uh, solving this issue and working and campaigning and advocating for change where it affects Shias and suffering Shia families and communities. So join us for this discussion between Said Ali Raza and Sister Medina as we discuss the topic of what is this thing called Shia genocide and how can we make steps towards ending it? So beginning the discussion, and this question is to you, Sayyid, um, the religion of Islam is, of course, a religion of peace. And that's something which is very important to us and very important to the way we speak about this faith. But in our history, we have many moments of violence and suffering to get to this point. It seems like when you look back, we keep seeing the ones who bring the message experiencing suffering themselves. So if we want to discuss Shia genocide or the suffering of the Shia, we should go far back to the beginning and see when did this begin? So if I could ask you, where do you think the suffering of the Shia begins? And when does it become an instance of a system of suffering? When, when do we see that starting? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, many a times people who come into power or many a times people who uh, take the power or usurp the power oppress the people who oppose them. So the opposition is um, many times not many times, generally it is a rule that the people who take the power, they will always try to crush the opposition. And after the Holy Prophet Sallallahu if you look at the division between all the Muslims, it starts with the succession of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu And when that dispute began, uh, there was the people who took the power and then there was Ali ibn Talib salam, or the Ahlul Bayt who claimed that they deserve the power. They deserve the authority. And they are ordained from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the, uh, the authority lies with them. Now, many people supported them and anyone who was on their side, because they happened to be in opposition, the people on their side, which were Shias, which remained to be Shias, were crushed, were persecuted, were tortured. And as a result, we have seen that continuously over the 14 centuries that whenever the other side came into power, they punished the Shias for not accepting uh, the masses or the, um, the rule of the Khilafah. Now, you can see in the history that uh, the people that sided with Ali ibn Abi Talib were all um, not only just uh, persecuted or killed, they were banned or they were deprived of the normal rights of all the other Muslims. For example, when uh, the Muslims were generally given some stipulants or you know some sort of wages or something from the government from Bayt al Mad, the Shias or the people who were on the side of the Harib al Muslim, because they were opposition to the governments, they were deprived of those rights. 
And not only um, Ali ibn Abi Talib and Fatma Zahra, they further Qawali and their um, um, entire uh, gardens or um, plantation were taken away from them. But likewise, the people who sided with them, they had similar treatments. So this is an ongoing um, a treatment of the Shia from the beginning of times of uh, the Muslim history. It has continued, it became worse in the times of uh, Banu Umayyah. And then if you look at the peace treaty between Imam Hassan and Mushtaba and Muawiyah, he says very clearly that one of the conditions for the uh, peace treaty is that you must leave all the wealth in the treasury of Kufa uh, for me. And I would spend it on the Shias of my father because I do know that the followers of my father will be deprived of all their rights uh, and they'll be uh, uh, starved to death. And therefore, this treasury must not leave uh, Kufa and I will provide for the, the followers of my father. So, and likewise, if you look at the times after Karbala, the Imams and Imam were continuously killed after that, and the Umayyah continued uh, to, uh, to persecute and also deprive uh, the Shias of their rights. Bani Abbas, when they came into power, they directly confronted the Ahlul Bayt al because they had taken the government in the name of Ahlul Bayt, and they wanted the people not to uh, understand or to recognize who the Ahlul Bayt were. So they continuously claimed that we are the Ahlul Bayt, we are the from the Holy Prophet's uncle's progeny, Abbas's progeny. So you can see, and then I can continue speaking, um, uh, but I would like to end here. But if you, if you look at the history, so even after Abbasids, when other people came into power, they continued uh, the similar methodology, which was laid by the early rulers of Islam. And you can see that not only in Arabian countries, but you can see that in the Persian countries, you can see that in the subcontinent, and you can see that in many other parts of the world, whenever uh, people see uh, the ide Shia ideology, they would always try to crush them because they think that this ideology has some substance and it can attract people and it can make them their followers. Medina, I can see you want to say something, so I'll let you straight in. Right, of course. Um, like to say it so eloquently put, um, it was under the you know Umayyads that we see a number of instances that involve like the very like brutal use of violence and extra lethal force, ranging from you know like the reign of terror of Abdullah bin Ziyad, Allah Alayh, um, that he imposed upon like the Shia of Kufa, and you know, including and after the tragedies tragedies of Karbala. Um, Historically, when you read non-Islamic works that talk about the martyrdom of Imam Hussein alayhi it's really interesting to note that in the same way that his death and the death of his family members and his companions are described, it's described as a massacre. And when you see similar languages and classifications that are applied to this really like divine and holy context that we understand it as a Shia ourselves, um, apply to more contemporary instances of violence against supporters of the Ahlubayt. So I know we'll get into this more later, but this is like the Spiker Massacre, where they say like estimates of what was 1,700 um, Shia cadets were individually, you know, handpicked and ex executed en masse. Uh, that's not to detract in any way from the holy like sanctity of Karbala and everything that it means and, means and stands for, but to show how violence against the supporters of the Ahlubayt has very deep roots, like you initially mentioned in the question you posed. Yeah, and now that we have Karbala, using it for contemporary suffering of Shia, it gives us like a lens to understand the context of our suffering today because it, it comes from, you know, this moment. Say it, there are many instances of suffering of the Shia, but Karbala, it seems like this, like it's a distinct moment compared to all of the others. And as Sister mentioned, the word massacre has been used by even non-Muslims. In the history of Shia genocide, why is Karbala special? Why is it different to the others that we have? It's a very important question. And sometimes even our... Uh, Shia uh, people can uh, draw conclusion I've seen because of the uh, massacres happening in Iraq, in Afghanistan, Pakistan, in many of the countries, in uh, Lebanon, in uh, Bahrain, 
in Yemen, in many parts in Nigeria. I can, you know, the list goes on, to be honest. But these are the countries that have given the most uh, shahada, like Iraq, Iran, and many other countries. These are highest number of Shia and shahada. Now, sometimes, you know, our people can draw similarities and say, this is today's Karbala. We can say that it is today's Karbala, but there is nothing like Karbala, not only because the volm or the oppression that happened in Karbala has not repeated, but more importantly, the personalities that were present in Karbala were never present at the same time anyway. So you may have one Imam being killed or a few infallibles or a few prophets or a few people, but the stature of the people that were present with Imam Hussein the 72, uh, and the 18 family members, they were of a caliber that if a similar thing happens today with someone that happened to Imam Hussain al -Islam, it's still not the same because no one is like Imam Hussain al -Islam. And never in history you could see that a person places his knee on a person's chest and then cuts his veins and then takes his neck off and cuts his arms. And so there is no one like Imam Hussain al -Islam. There is no one like Abbas al -Islam. There is no one like Ali Akbar al -Islam. So all of those personalities that were killed in Karbala because of their stature, what has happened in Karbala because those people were so high in ranking before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why we do not say that there is any place like Karbala. There is no oppression like Karbala. So we have had many thousands of massacres of the Shias on, or the persecutions or the killings, but no places like Karbala because no one is like Imam Hussain al-Islam and no one is like the Shuhada of Karbala. Imam Hussain himself wasalam, says that the companions that I have, even my grandfather, my father, and my brother did not have. So the shahada of Karbala are, are, are unique, where the imams, like Imam Sadiq salam, comes and says, Assalamu alaikum uh, uh, to the shahada of Karbala, and he says, Be abi antumam. You know, so the words that are used by the imams to send their salutations and blessings upon those shahada um, uh, tell us about. The, the stature of those shahada. So there, there, there is no other Karbala because there, is, there are no other people like the ones that were in Karbala. Clearly there's like an etiquette because we have La Yom Yom Ya Abdullah and then we have Kulu Yom in Asha, Kulu Adin Karbala. And it, people seem like, oh, maybe there's a conflict between these mentalities. But the truth is, like you mentioned, it's the personalities that makes the distinction. Because someone that mentioned more people died in this massacre or more children or they, they can use numbers to quantify these things but you cannot quantify to whom these things happened um yes. i have to ask you you know this phrase uh, every day is ashura every land is karbala is there a correct way of understanding it is there an etiquette of applying it correctly that we could do try today okay so there is this statement that you mentioned earlier, La Yomaka Yomaka Ya Abdullah. This is from Imam Hassan Mushtaba Salam at the time of his shahada. And you know, when we say that there is no place like Karbala, what do we mean? Uh, you know, meaning that we can still today give the allegiance to Imam Hussain Alayhi Salam sitting in London or sitting in I don't know wherever we may be. But you can still pay allegiance to Imam Hussain al-Islam. You can still be faithful to Imam Hussain al-Islam. You can still be a true follower and say that if I was, Ya Laytani Kuntum Akum, if I was with you, I would have given my life for you. So that's why every day is Karbala. Every place is Karbala and every day is Ashura because even today we can give allegiance to Imam Hussain al-Islam. And even here, I can still uh, pay my condolence to Imam Hussain al-Islam and uh, refer him as my imam. So you can show your passion, your love and your respect, and you can pay your allegiance to Imam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at any day, at any place. This is uh, the true understanding. Not that, um, so there are many, many explanations of this, which may not be acceptable. And there are many other explanations that may be acceptable. Yeah, very true. Uh, Sister Medina, in your research, how have you found Karbala or Ashura as useful in understanding anti-Shia violence or, or anti-Shia genocide or Shia genocide or anti-Shia animosity today, how do we how do we use this event in a contemporary way? 
Well, I think it's a really interesting question because in terms of applying it in a contemporary context, we look at, you know, gatherings and processions that occur, especially in places like Pakistan or Afghanistan in these predominantly Shia areas or neighborhoods as places in which there's many Shia that are coalescing, they're coming to pay their respects and to mourn. And unfortunately, that in some way makes them a target, um, especially for a lot of instances of, instances of terrorists looking to um, further marginalize the Shia from whatever political situation or climate um, is currently going on. And, you know, it's fascinating to me and really inspiring, actually, that in spite of all this, that you only see Maharam and Ashura processions in commemorations and gatherings only growing year after year. And we see, you know, especially in terms of like Arbaeen, every year the walk from, you know, Najaf to Karbala only grows and, you know, we see estimates reaching anywhere from like 15 to 25 million. So I think in terms of understanding the scale um, and the kind of cyclical nature of the violence that unfortunately, um, perhaps, I don't think conveniently is the right word, but um, for argument's sake, it's a, it helps in understanding the waves and violence of violence that, that transpire. I know violence is quite important to your thesis in general. Um, especially understanding genocide as a concept and then applying it to the Shia. Violence in our history, how do we use instances of violence in the past to understand violence today? Is it the same thing we're speaking about? Well, I mean, I think in understanding when this question of like when Shia genocide began, right? We're looking at this idea of genocide as, let's say, if we're looking at terms of like international law, for example, we're taking this definition or like this mandated, you know, framework that has come however many years after Ashura actually transpired and applying it backwards. Um, so when we ask ourselves, when did Shia genocide actually begin? We look at instances of mass violence against the Shia. Uh, it can refer to any number of things. So when has targeted anti-Shia violence begun? When has it reached genocidal thresholds? And at what point have you know, instances of mass violence against the Shia begin and end on a more local level, right? Because we can say localized instances of Shia violence or, or yeah, Shia genocide. Um, and, you know, the final one that I think is really interesting to me in my research is when and how has this narrative of Shia genocide um, began to take traction? Because the, I think the answer to the first two are much more straightforward in that, you know, we can recognize there have been people who have been killed for their Shia identity since the first moment that the Khilafah was usurped from Imam Ali al so, um, And when it comes to instances of localized genocide, we can learn, look at the mass extrajudicial executions of Shia in Saudi Arabia, I mean, Hijaz, or the targeting of a maternity ward in a predominantly Shia neighborhood in Afghanistan. So we can look at these instances of violence in kind of moments that are more encapsulated, and we can look at them more on a continuity. Um, so I think it's really a matter of not necessarily taking our understanding of anti-Shia violence in this religious framework that we understand it and have ingrained in ourselves in, and a trying to like fit them into like these, you know, categories of Western law and like nomenclature and like, you know, categorizations, but trying to bridge the gap. And it's even things such as simple as um, not referring it to it as sectarian violence, because the term sect itself has inherently, you know, Western like colonialist implications, because when you say sect, it kind of insinuates that this other religious group is an offshoot. You know, they're they're non-orthodox, they're kind of deviant in some way, right? When, and when you refer to the Shia as a sect, it kind of further perpetuates and feeds into this Wahhabi ideology, I think, that prefers to other and marginalize the Shia, that kind of facilitates the violence that they, that they are in favor of. Because the moment you say sect, it's as if there are two forces fighting against one another. And the right. one who claims Shia genocide will hear the term Sunni genocide against them, whereas these are not binary phenomenon. Right. Um, this idea of narrative, I think, is really interesting. Um, because it's about, we, we are grown up, we, we grow up being told that we are oppressed. It's part of our identity that we are oppressed. That our history, our heritage comes from suffering and we should not abandon our faith because of how much blood has been shed in, in the course of us being Shia today. Uh, Sayyid, when you look back at, um, you know, Shia mothers raising their children and the ulama's role in teaching Islam, I feel like we've always been told that suffering is a part of being a Shia, that it's a part of our identity. 
that it is to be a Shia means to live in a life of suffering or to know someone who is going through this issue. Is this me? How long has this been the case where we have to be under oppression to be Shia? Okay. I think it's a very interesting question and we need to look deeply into this because many of the children growing up in Europe and in North America and also in New Zealand, Australia, also many other parts of the world, where they have not seen any uh, violence against them for being Shia. And sometimes even, you know, the new generation that is growing up of my children's age, uh, or probably uh, people, you know, a little older than them, uh, growing up in Pakistan now, who have not truly seen the takfir of the Shias, who, or who were very small in the 90s, to witness and understand uh, the uh, kill in the Shia target killing or the violence against Shias or the open condemnation or declara declaration of the Shias being uh, infidels or disbelievers. So now when they see this again today in today's age, you know, during this Muharram, um, it is new to them. So sometimes, you know, when we say that uh, it is a part, you know, we have always witnessed, even when in the past few decades when people were uh, at ease and at peace in Europe and uh, North America and many other parts of the world, there was still violence going on against Shias in many, many, many parts of the world, including, uh, you know, uh, Iraq during uh, the past decade or so in Bahrain, in the past four decades continuously in Afghanistan, in many other parts of the world. So. I think it is important that our children today not only just learn the history and know the history, uh, but they should know the history at depth and at length, and also contemporary issues. They should be aware of, you know, with social media now there is more awareness, but I think there is information and disinformation where the children need to be given the right information. Uh, and told what's going on in the in the current circumstances. Now, as far as your question is concerned, many times we are told to accept suffering. For example, you know, like uh, I was talking to a family in uh, in Karbala, and, and I said, why didn't you migrate? You know, when people were leaving Iraq, migrating from Karbala, and uh, when you saw that Saddam is killing everyone. So the lady, you know, the elderly woman, she said, our forefathers told us that, look, if you want to live in Karbala, then be prepared for trials and tribulations because it's a land of trials and, you know, continuously you will have to, to witness hardship. So we decided that, no, no matter what happens, our children are killed, our brothers were killed, but we continue to stay here. So we can see all of those, but, uh, you know, sometimes the leadership has to organize and sometimes we're not powerful enough or we're not strong enough, we're not organized enough to confront uh, our oppressors. Um, so we are so weak that even if we try and organize, and uh, it's not that Shias have never tried to organize. They have. And, you know, sometimes, you know, when you look or see in history or even today in parts of the world, you think, you know, what are they, what are they doing? It's, it's not easy to to fight against the governments. You know, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm taking so much time, but you know, but in Bahrain or in Afghanistan or in many other parts where oppressive governments or in Iraq or in Lebanon, in Syria, well, Syria has had contemporary history, has been pro-Shia, but you know, uh, history has not been kind to them. Well, even in, in, in Turkey or in Malaysia, or, you know, I, I can continue counting the countries, but you know, it hasn't been easy, but we need to understand that Sometimes for being on the right path, you have to make sacrifices and you cannot just expect, well, you know, we are on the right path, so we should be better off. No, the people who were prophets and Anbiya and, you know, messengers and Aymah al-Bayt al so Anbiya al they've always suffered. You know, the people on the right path have to make sacrifices and you have to accept that you may try and organize and you may try and talk to the government and you may try everything, but you may still have to go through all of those sufferings. Yeah, and this suffering, as Sister Medina mentioned earlier, leads to a kind of strength that the numbers keep increasing despite, despite the suffering. And you mentioned a number of countries which people probably don't know about, you know, Malaysia and a few others where, where we have this issue. Uh, Sister Medina, in your research, you must have seen the suffering of Shia in a multitude of nations which perhaps don't get coverage. 
Uh, definitely. Um, so in my research, um, just to provide a bit of background, I found a small transnational cadre of like activists who are working to reframe violence experienced by the Shia Muslims across the globe as genocide. But the Shia genocide framing has yet to gain, gain wider traction. And I want to ask why. Because I personally found it, obviously, perhaps this is a bit biased, but as a really compelling narrative. Um, so in my article that I'm working on, I map this emerging transnational social movement with the aim of better understanding its organizations, its prospects, and of course its limitations. So I'm drawing on data from 12 original interviews with activists, academics, and religious scholars, as well as students living, like international students who have historically, not historically, but grown up living in um, predominantly Sunni states within the, um, within the Gulf Coast who are actually um, Shia, who actually identify as Shia. Um, and I actually found that among these stakeholder groups, many actually disagree significantly about the appropriate framing of violence because they aren't, well, for a number of reasons, but part of it is that they're so unaware of instances of anti-Shiism beyond their own scope, beyond their own experience. So for example, there's a lot of variation between um, anti-Shia violence that occurs in Africa compared to that that occurs in the, um, in the Gulf Coast countries compared to that in the subcontinent compared to that in um, Central Asia, in Malaysia. And there's, um, there's actually very limited exposure and this idea of a transnational com Shia community is actually far more common in our understanding from like our uncomfortable homes in, in the West because as identifying as Shia in the West, we kind of not necessarily give up, but we don't necessarily identify as strongly with you know, our country of national nationality or things like that. And we far more recognize these individual rights and you know, you know, this whole culture of advocacy and human rights um, lobbying is far more, not prevalent, but it's, it's something that I think we can definitely work on. Um, it is something that we need to actually work on in terms of building coalitions beyond ethnic lines. So increasing awareness of just how transnational anti-Shia violence is, I think um, is crucial. And I also hope I answered part of your question in terms of like the range of different countries. So everywhere from Bahrain to Oman, to Qatar, to um, Nigeria, Malaysia, even in France, um, in, in European countries, there's actually a significant amount of anti shiism that goes unreported. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there something you wanted to add to it? I have seen and witnessed that many times, you know, there were attacks on Shia centers, uh, there were attacks on Shia individuals, there were uh, attacks, sometimes, you know, they've been killed, sometimes they were not killed, but they were attacked. So there are many, many incidents in the West as well, uh, by the, uh, the Takfiri Wahhabi uh, people. So we've, uh, we've witnessed, and she's perfectly right, in uh, Belgium, uh, there was a burn down of a center with uh, Sheikh, Sheikh Abdullah Dadu, who was a convert, uh, a Moroccan originally. Um, and he, he died in that, uh, the burning of the mosque. And we've had other incidents the individual. So she's perfectly right that there are many, many countries where the Shia genocide goes unreported. In fact, an, an orthodox way where this happens is those who go and fight in groups like Daesh who then return back to Europe, come back having been attacked direct, attacking directly Shia population. And that target often remains. There was, a, there was a concern when they were coming back in 2016 and uh, 17 that maybe then they come back, they would plan these attacks towards our Shia centers in the UK and Canada and America, mainly in Europe from what I was observing. And we had never had this issue before. People usually grew up in the West in relative safety and don't have the, the they live with a kind of privilege, a luxury that we live in a country which protects us. But as you mentioned, Sister Medina, we in the West don't look with a nationalistic approach. We're not looking as a British Shia supporting Nigerian Shia or as an American Shia supporting Bahraini Shia. It, it seems like because we're in the West where we're delineated from the kind of uh, national boundaries. Do you see people in different countries in transnational movements having solidarity with each other? Do we see interplay between the, the, the victims of Shia genocide in the world right now? Actually, unfortunately, there's a, 
a significant absence of that, where you'll find a Shia in Oman or in Kuwait or in Saudi um, might be completely uh, ignorant to the fact that there is even such a concept as Shia genocide occurring against, um, you know, mem like Pakistani Shias. Uh, and, you know, if I bring up the fact that, you know, there's actually this database that uh, this alternative news source called Let Us Build Pakistan has come out with, and they've been documenting, I think, ever since uh, the mid 19, 19, 1900s up to 2015, the amount of targeted Shia killings that have happened um, reaches in the tens of thousands. So if I even describe something like this to a Shia in, a, in, in Nigeria or in um, Malaysia, they might be, because they might be so, and not for the wrong re reasons, concerned with, you know, their own, like targeting that's happening within their own communities, they might not be as aware as, uh, as aware of the suffering of other members of the sh transnational Shia community. Said we have to speak a little about Pakistan because sister mentioned it right now. And I know how involved you are in that struggle, literally on the front line in Pakistan and also from the UK and the work that you do. People don't understand the experience of being a Pakistani Shia and why people often feel like these things often conflict when Shia genocide is either supported by the state or in the past it has been or tolerated by the state. The amount of targeted killings and, and violence that happens. Could you summarize for us why there is an issue of Shia violence in Pakistan and what the situation is now? Okay, well, uh, if you look at the formation of Pakistan in 1947, when it was formed, the founder of Pakistan was a Shia. And most of the people who sponsored the state of Pakistan were Shias. So many of the Rajas of India, the Nawabs of India, who unfortunately didn't even migrate. And many of their parts of the world did not actually, for many reasons, I don't want to go into that now, did not become a part of Pakistan. They had actually sponsored. So uh, many uh, of the Rajas and Nawabs of India had actually paid, and though, you know, Shia Nawabs and Shia Rajas had paid, uh, you know, contributed financially towards the forming of Pakistan. Now, in the beginning, many of the uh, uh, the leaders, political leaders, and also civil servants um, were all Shias. And um, unfortunately, in the 70s, the Islamic Revolution in Iran gave a bad taste in the uh, in the mouth to the Pakistan establishment, and they felt that the Shias of Pakistan were very closely attached and uh, um, lining up or the then uh, leadership and the religious Shia movement, Tariq Jafriya was very much close to the Shias of Iran and the Shia leadership in Iran. And after that, uh, the international establishment, especially the Americans, when uh, Afghanistan was under attack, um, they needed the jihadi movement uh, to save Afghanistan, and 80% of the literature was published in America and distributed in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and they wanted the Pakistanis to actually go and fight in Afghanistan against Russia. So it was sponsored by the Saudis, and obviously, if the Saudi was going to be sponsoring anything, it was going to be Wahhabi. So the Pakistani community did not have a strong uh, and a big Wahhabi population, or the Diobandi or Ahli Hadith population. So the two were strengthened by the Saudis and in the 80s, the war in Afghanistan, the war between Iran and Iraq, um, the American you know, line of action and the South, it strengthened the Wahhabis in Pakistan and the Shia target killing on a very high scale and depriving Shias of any main government positions was uh, uh, initiated. <clears throat> Before that, in the 60s and 50s, yes, there were differences between Shias and Sunnis, but it was nothing major. Only in, this, in 1964, there was uh, a major incident in Terry, in Khairpur, in uh, Sindh, in, India, in Pakistan. Uh, but after that, things were under control in the 60s and 70s. So the number of incidents happened in the 60s and 70s. But uh, after General Ziaul Haq came into power, uh, the line shifted over to the Wahhabis. And that's when the Shia uh, Shias were marginalized. And 
it continued after that because the line of the establishment unfortunately went against Shias and they decided that the Shias were a threat to the security of Pakistan because they were closer to Iran and the Iranian leadership than they were to the Pakistani political leadership. And many people see that as um, a time when the establishment decided that the Shias were not loyal enough to Pakistan. So they were loyal, but they were not loyal enough. Therefore, they needed some other um, um, splinter groups or political groups and religious groups that would be loyal to the establishment, to Pakistan, who would fight against. And in recent history, unfortunately, what is now happening in Pakistan, or what may happen in the next few months and few years, uh, will be the consequence of uh, the thousands of Pakistanis, Wahhabis that went to Syria to fight uh, on behalf of Daesh. And when they're returning back to Pakistan, obviously they have those sentiments and uh, the mentality or ideology of killing Shias. Uh, and we do hear and uh, uh, it's a, it's now very clear news that a lot of the ISIS soldiers have been um, have been fl flown over to Afghanistan from Syria and uh, Iraq, and I, I'm not sure of the numbers, but I've heard over a hundred thousand soldiers, uh, you know, ISIS soldiers have been um, have been moved from uh, Syria and Iraq to Afghanistan. And Afghanistan means Pakistan, so they have very now the Pakistani government because they have changed the block from America to China. Obviously, the Americans and Saudis are not happy with that, uh, but the Chinese do not want any violence in Pakistan because they have uh, spent billions and billions of dollars in Pakistan. Uh, but we are hearing that many of these Daesh uh, or the ISIS soldiers that have returned to Pakistan and that have now appeared in Afghanistan will be carrying out serious operations in Afghanistan against Shias and in Pakistan. So we will be, God forbid, I hope I'm, and I pray that I'm wrong, but uh, I have heard uh, from strong sources that in the next few months and next few years, we will see violence against Shias uh, in, in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Wow, well, Sis thoughts? Uh, Sayed, I can only pray that you're wrong, but uh, unfortunately, I don't think that's a completely unrealistic, you know, prediction, especially um, drawing on a lot of the, the history that you mentioned, and to see that trajectory is not at all outside the scope of possibility. Also, when you take into, like, consideration the most recent um, mass freeing of uh, Taliban prisoners in Afghanistan in the most, the past few months of peace talks between the, the U.S. and the Taliban in Qatar. Um, yeah, it's it's a really unfortunate situation. I remember Sheikh Nimr Shahid used to say that in Saudi, you feel like the walls hear you when you speak, you're Shia, like they're always listening. And I know that in Pakistan, there's a lot of surveillance upon Shia individuals who are prominent and also who are, who are well known. And you often, you wonder if you can even feel safe anymore in Pakistan before all of this happens. Say that you're always traveling, when you go, do you feel safe in this country? Do you, the people you interact with when you meet them, can they live a life of stability even now in Pakistan? Well, any prominent figure in Pakistan, any Shia prominent figure um, is always under threat. And in the past few years, probably two decades, we have seen uh, from since 1999 when Pervez Musharraf came into power, uh, that everything stopped. So. Um, I don't want to give any conclusions why it stopped. Um, so when democracy was in power, so some, some people say that probably the establishment was behind the target killing and the uh, marginalizing of the Shias in the 90s. Uh, but as soon as Professor Musharraf came into power, so there are many, many reasons why, but the Shia target killing stopped and the Shia marginalizing, um, you know, seemingly ended, but then Again, um, it started and, you know, it never happened in, you know, in the past two decades, there was more stability in Pakistan. Uh, and also after the Taliban were thrown out in Afghanistan, 
there was more stability. But now, um, even about Taliban, that there will be a truce between Taliban and America, uh, and that the Americans will allow the uh, Taliban, uh, you know, so, uh, soldiers and fighters to be freed and come into power. Uh, although it has only happened now this year, but I knew of this that this is happening four years back when you know when there were initial talks and people had actually said that this is going to happen this what has happened in 2020 people were telling us in uh, 2016 that this is going to happen and it seemed like a a, a dream a nightmare or uh, a, a false um, um prediction that this will happen you know, after 9-11, the Americans, you know, the first country they attacked was Afghanistan and destroyed the Taliban government and uh, said that, you know, uh, it was a mistake that the Americans, you, you know, the same Taliban obviously were called Mujahideen against uh, Russians. They were armed uh, and then they were left. And then Saudis and Pakistanis continued to support them. And then the Americans came and destroyed them. And now after destroying them, they have again found another truce. I'm sorry, I think I've become too political and uh, uh, giving very open discussions on all of these things. Please, please say it. Uh, but I do see that um, in the uh, near future, uh, the consequences of all of these international political uh, stances obviously have localized effects. And we will be seeing the effects of all of these international um, truces and you know international political changes economical changes they all have consequences and we will be seeing the consequences of these in the oncoming few years in many parts of the world um, if and when china takes over the chinese have said that yes they do not wish to be a superpower meaning they don't want to replace america and run the world but Obviously, they would want some sort of control, so it will be localized. Uh, but we don't know until the things unfold how things will unfold. Yeah, I'm sensing a theme here, which is when we began, we spoke about Shia genocide coming from power and the relation of power, which you began with. Then we discussed the line of establishment shifting against and towards the Shia. Now we're speaking quite clearly about which superpowers want this to happen, which superpowers are against this kind of violence. Uh, Sister Medina, it seems like however long we're advocating against Shia genocide, we're always speaking against the establishment, against the state, against uh, the superpowers. Uh, is there a way to, I don't know, reverse our thinking or are we always going to be talking up to power? Well, I mean, if you look, if you go back and you look at the patterns of violence and you look at patterns of advocacy and where they've, where they've intersected, you also look at the fact, you also find that much advocacy has been that has been done has been reactionary right we're not taking preemptive steps we're not advocating for during the, like you know seasons of peace we're not we're not looking to ensure protections for uh the shia during uh, maharam and ashura um i think actually some permissions have been given to shia communities within kabul and afghanistan for the actual community members to arm themselves um so they are protected in in the case of an attack but you know, making sure like our advocacy isn't exclusively in reaction to violence, and you know we're we're taking more of an initiative and we're being proactive, I think can help. But also, it's this idea of feeling as though we're always talking up to states, when in reality that's not that's not always an issue, even though it usually is, because when you look at the definition of genocide, it's not necessary for the state to be the perpetrator of the violence. Um, so in the, in the actual um, definition of the 1941, 1948, sorry, um, genocide convention, there's no real mention of state institutions even needing to be involved for a mass killing to be considered a genocide. And I know a lot of people can often get really frustrated with these discussions because they sound as though we're just arguing over semantics. But in reality, it makes a really big difference, difference actually to those who are affected by violence because, you know, very broadly speaking, a state's course of actions speaks very highly of the values that it prioritizes, right? So, which in turn, you know, would hope represent the population, but that's a different discussion. So that's kind of why, as it stands, condemnations still matter, for example, from government officials and from governments. So 
so pushing for condemnations of you know, Sapa, Sahaba, Lashkar Jangvi, the Taliban, Al Qaeda, ISIS, all these terrorist organizations and their affiliates. Asking for condemnations of these organizations from governments is still really important because, at the very least, you know that the government is not on their side. But when the government is silent, it, it creates this really eerie and unsettling atmosphere that further, um, you know, lessens this idea or, you know, increases that, increases the idea that, you know, you're constantly at risk. But we can't just stop there um, in terms of looking at just for condemnations and just, you know, words and statements. Um, and we look at, like, you know, states and let me know if I'm like, you know, you know, um, getting ahead of the discussion. But when we look at states like, you know, Pakistan and Nigeria and even, you know, Yemen, when we look at, you know, their, the range and culpability in Pakistan and Nigeria, especially, we see a pretty significant range in the mechanisms that's used. So, for example, I know, you know, recently in Pakistan, the repressive law, you know, that's trying to ban the recitation of Ziyat Ashura in public, um, that, that differs um, in the means, but not necessarily in the result of Shia, of, you know, anti, anti Shiism, because, well, in comparison to the Nigerian army, right, when they actually executed almost 350 civilians in an incident known as the Zaria massacre in 2015. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was the same incident in which uh, Sheikh Ibrahim Zaki was captured and still currently imp imprisoned. Um, so we see a range in culpability in the role that, that states play, whether it's explicitly or implicitly supporting, you know, these ideologies. Um, and I think recognizing the different ways it manifests is really important to um, recognizing Shia, anti-Shiism and Shia genocide wherever it manifests. Um, and also, just one final note, um, we also often like identify it as terms of, in terms of like physical violence and physicality like arrests and, you know, killings and executions and things. But if we take a step back and look at the broader purpose of genocide and how it's meant to eliminate, you know, some group and the identity and, you know, the values they hold, perhaps it's worth, worth, worth considering how, you know, the destruction of heritage sites and holy sites like Janet Lubachi actually fit within this framework as well. So I think just remaining cognizant of the complexity and the sheer range of, of the situation um, by itself can help improve our advocacy. A, a very, very useful reflection because all of the things you mentioned, there is silence by many states about these very issues. General Dubaghi is a great example. Like whenever we try to advocate for this issue, it's as if the world isn't interested or it's not, it's not you know, significant enough to garner media attention. I'll be another example. We have the largest marches, the large processions, and yet it won't gain media attention. But when it comes to this kind of active violence against people, still there is silence. One must wonder why. Say, it, why are so many states and governments silent about this issue so that we have to condemn it or are, urge them to co condemn it? Why are they not condemning it themselves? Yeah, it's a very important question. Not only that they do not condemn it or speak against it, you know, they turn a blind eye to what is happening. They allow all of this to happen. It is upon the law enforcement agencies to establish peace and safety of the citizens. And when a citizen is killed and the police or the law enforcement agencies turns a blind eye or turns the other way and says, okay, continue. So they are allowing all of this to happen. In recent, year, in recent weeks after Ashura in Pakistan, we have had uh, you know, target killing of 14 different Shia people in Pakistan. And the current government has completely been silent. Not a single government official has openly condemned it or spoken uh, against it. We've had opposition leaders, or not opposition directly leaders, but opposition parties that have, I don't want to mention any names, but who have openly condemned and said that it is uh, target killing happening again, and Shias are being targeted. So they have been people who, politicians, who have mentioned it, uh, but the government seems to be completely out of touch or ignoring it. Now, the sometimes, so there are different factors. So sometimes the governments allow this to happen. Sometimes it is a policy of the establishment to uh, to ignore 
and to to again allow you know when your own allies you know if i if i was a true friend of yours and if i saw you make a mistake then i would speak and say do not do this this is not going to be good for you in this world and the hereafter uh, but sometimes you know the the violence for example they waited for certain teenage boys to turn 18 so they could execute them in saudi arabia who were all shias they waited for certain uh, shia boys who were teenagers when they were protesting against the government or the, against the saudi government or the saudi king for the boy to turn 18 so they could behead him so we can see all of these happening and the americans and sometimes the europeans don't speak out as if nothing has happened um so they need to make it known that they are actively uh, uh you know uh, advocating human rights and uh, uh, places of worship and none of that that those happen in fact it was under the british um rule uh of the subcontinent when jannatul baqi was destroyed and it was the uh, ottoman empire who had been thrown out and the truce between them was you know the, the, the british government had uh, called uh of, you know like it's now coming to a hundred years that khilafat usmani or the turks went out of power of makkah and medina and the khilafat usmani and uh, the uh, ali saud were given the power and it was under the british watchful eyes and the british empire the british raj in the world that jannah al baqi was destroyed and when people made a point uh, they were uh, they were silenced in fact many people were sent to see medina if in fact you know jannah al baqi was destroyed or not and when they came back they said yes it is it is it's been destroyed as well this will cause a shia sunni friction so what do you want to do save your community and not cause a friction then be quiet and keep quiet about this uh so um we can see that this happens all the time and even the things that are happening in many parts of the world even today um where the government just turn a blind eye the law enforcement agencies will not support you uh, in fact your basic constitutional rights will be taken away from you and no one will will ever support you in fact i have i can tell you about pakistan that the shia uh victims of law when they went into the prisons um they did not have lawyers to defend them in the courts and if ever a shia stood up and said okay i'll fight your case they were either a uh, uh, a victim of target killing or they were Uh, uh threatened so badly that they said okay i'm dropping this case and i will not defend this person in the court uh in even in recent history a a person from america from houston originally pakistani from karachi who had migrated to america after you know the target killing in the 90s to america and he went back he was a lawyer pakistani lawyer he went back to fight the cases of certain uh victims who were innocent and no one knew that he has come back and when he went to islamabad he was shot dead he was killed only and only because he was defending the shia victims and the shia innocent uh people who were in the prisons so you know i'm sure you know these suicide bombings that happen am i taking too long no you are not said bismillah you know this uh, you know the suicide bombing i'm sure that you know when the suicide bombers come from north of pakistan to south to karachi to punjab to do the suicide bombing they are not wearing the suicide jackets so someone provides them with the suicide jacket someone provides their traveling expenses someone guides them when they arrive in karachi or in different cities of pakistan so they stay in a few you know like in a household they these are called the people who uh you, you know who are um providing the grounds for the crime 
fine, it was a suicide attack. So the suicide bomber has now died. He blew himself up. What about the facilitators? How many facilitators have ever been caught? How many people providing the finances have ever been caught? So there is a huge failure, if not um, siding with the, you know, so I want to just say there's failure. Okay, let's say just, I don't want to use any harsh words, but there's a failure of the governments and the law enforcement agencies and the uh, secret services that they have never ever caught in the past 30 years the suicide bombers uh, or the facilitators, you know, so the people who are providing all of the services to them or facilitating their crimes. How many have you caught? That's my question from the governments. So this leads back to a point made earlier by Sister Medina, which was that uh, the definition of maybe genocide or illegal or suicide bombing or these things came after the beginning of Shia genocide. And many times it's like they've been defined in a way that we can never meet these standards to have practical action, to have actual prosecution, because they're defined in a way which doesn't let us do this. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Sister Medina, how do we face this challenge of framing our discussions in a practical way to have practical solutions? I think that question of framing is, I think, paramount and is actually the focus of my research because I was, you know, I initially attended a conference, uh, not this past April, but in the previous year, and that was entitled, um, it was organized by a organization called Muslims United for Justice, and the name of the event was the marginalization of the Shia narrative, and that was where I personally had first become familiar with this narrative of Shia genocide, and then after that, I began to do some more research, and I think it really is this process of, like, you know, educating yourself and doing your own independent research that really is transformative, but um, in, in addition to that, uh, I came across this article by um, a international legal scholar named Emily Hawley, and she published in Genocide Studies International, where she makes the case for the legal case for Shia genocide, especially within Iraq, but her, her rationale can really be extended to wherever we see um, instances of Shia genocide. And, you know, within, you know, the, the international definition of, you know, genocide, I mean, it's it's not incredibly long, but it essentially boils down to really quickly killing members of a group, causing serious, serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group and the forcible transferal, transferal of children. And, you know, there's all these, these different conditions which make a lot of sense, but the most difficult part, and usually when it comes to proving genocide at an international legal like uh, level of international law, is that you need to prove intent. And this is usually a stumbling block for many other um, movements that are trying to reframe their own, you know, um, historical instances or even contemporary instances of mass violence as genocide because they can't prove the intent of the perpetrator. But in our in the case of the Shia, you can see in a lot of different literature published by these terrorist organizations and videos that they post that they explicitly intend to exterminate the Shia and that it is within a, in a huge part of their ideology to basically eliminate and eradicate anyone who doesn't conform to their exact very narrow um, idea or conception, a convoluted conception of what Islam is. So because we have that, we have that basis for proving intent, um, there, it's difficult for that's why I want to look into why this narrative of genocide isn't gaining traction because if all of the conditions for it to be understood as genocide have been met, where, where are our shortcomings in perpetuating this narrative and, you know, trying to, you know, raise awareness surrounding it using this framing? And I think we can learn something from the, from the case of Yemen. And, you know, it's different, when, what's different about Yemen is that while the majority of the targeted military campaigns are intended to weaken, you know, the northern stronghold of Ansar al-Law, they're also disproportionately having an effect on the Zaidi population in the country, Zaidi Shia population in the country, because that's also where they're concentrated. So while the Zaidi Shia, and say, please correct me if I'm mistaken, are closer to the Hanafi school in terms of fiqh and Jewish jurisprudence, ideologically, they do align more with the 12 Shias in that they recognize the Walaya of Amir al-Mu'min and they commemorate Muharram. Um, but when you look at Yemen, it's been framed almost masterfully in this way as the, human, the, 
greatest humanitarian crisis of our generation. And you know, you see these um, these ads on YouTube before you you watch a video that you know ask you to donate to Yemen, and it's understood within this humanitarian framework and context. But if you think about it, you know, a lot of the victims are undoubtedly these Zaidi Shias. So we ask ourselves, you know, is it a matter of overcoming these previous flawed frameworks like? sectarian violence or Iran-Saudi proxy war or like primordial hatreds? Um, is it just a matter of overcoming these frameworks or um, that we ourselves have used in describing uh, anti-Shia violence? Um, or like, you know, do we need to also take a much more heavy-handed approach to, you know, framing it more within a humanitarian context? I think, you know, questioning these uh, different approaches that we've been using so far and why they've been ineffective might give us a better idea as to what future direction holds more promise. That's a very beautiful point. How we frame uh, the discussion with wisdom has a direct effect on how we can use our suffering towards a practical here it is changing, including intent and proving that it was intend intended to be violent. Uh, Said, I've got to give you last word, inshallah, on this because we have to come to an end. How do you think we should, in addition to these points, frame the suffering of the Shia and Shia genocide? in other practical ways? What, what can we do in our discussions, in our language, to make the situation a little bit better? Um, a very good question. I think we've all been struggling uh, on use of uh, the social media. I think what it has done is it has given us a platform to share our experiences and our grievances and all the information of the news that the mainstream media does not share. But we are only, reaching out to our own uh, Shia community and not reaching out to the others, um, to the Sunni Muslims, to non-Muslims. And we haven't learned how to truly, how to properly use uh, social media uh, where we can try and give our views or our insight or our uh, side of the story to other people. Um, we have been the most oppressed uh, community, but we haven't been able to convey that to the larger communities or the Muslims at large. And uh, unfortunately, we haven't still come up with ideas. So there are very few people who even think about these um, uh, sites. So I think one of the most important things would be to, to always give a full narrative of the Shia killings and the Shia genocide and uh, produce uh, writings in such a way that that even uh, a non-Shia, when, when they read it, they find it interesting or they find it, yeah, it is a piece of research. Secondly, we need to be very active in uh, giving out the information on all the oppressions that are happening against the Shia community um, very quickly, promptly, and also uh, uh, you know, to not only just within the Shia, but also outside. So, uh, and the third thing I think we can do is um, we need to build bridges and we need to communicate with other faiths, uh, with other schools of thought, with other religions. Um, and once we start to communicate, all the people I've seen in London, that the people who've been in touch with Muslims have a different view of the Muslims and the people who've never met Muslims have only the view of the media. Uh, so, you know, like a, a bridge or a communication uh, bridge would always help your case. Um, and I think we need to learn to, to be able to build bridges and um, be proactive uh, in all of our initiatives, but also uh, keeping in contact, you know, like connection uh, and in the Tabat, you know, like. Um, this uh, uh, networking with other uh, other people is extremely important. Inshallah, we hope and pray the listeners take advantage of this advice and the advice before you by Sister Medina and all of the advice and uh, guidance in, in the discussion. This is the end. So thank you so much, Sir. Thank you, Sister Medina. Uh, we had a great discussion and uh, Alhamdulillah, we really hope the listeners can benefit and also think of their own solutions and their own approaches to learn from the great research Sister Medina is doing and the great khidmat that you are doing, Sayyid. Thank you both of you for today's episode. Uh, I think if we end together on a salat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala The genocide which we face today and have faced for generations 
is only because we are lovers of Ali ibn Abi Talib and the Ahlul Bayt. But we need to phrase our suffering and our difficulties we have gone through, which we've inherited, in a way that brings about political change. Because the issue we're facing, as we have just concluded, is from the state. It is from power, it's from the establishment. And so, educating ourselves and bearing in mind the advice given to us by Sister Medina and Sid Ali Raza will help us to make in the steps as the individual and make steps as the collective towards making a strategy against the oppression that we are facing as Shia. So to you, the listener, and to those of you who feel invested in the issue of Shia genocide, we hope that you may serve this cause and pray for those guests of ours who are also serving this cause to bring about the end of the suffering of the Shia or at least give our lives for the sake of our people and this qawm of the Imam of our time.